Hello and welcome to Technically Speaking, where scientists and engineers come together to chat about common interest, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Ellie and I'm joined by Emma and Antonia to talk about debunking myth and finding new facts. Ooh, a very exciting episode this week. Antonia, this was your idea. How did you come up with this? I was watching a YouTuber called Mooncat. She did a three-hour long video about debunking evolutionary psychology. Oh, that sounds It was really interesting. <laughs> did you learn anything uh, especially from three hours of a YouTube video? Yeah, I learned quite a lot of stuff, some rather concerning things, like these academics rack up loads of citations because they just refer to each other. And when you dig in deeper, sometimes it's not a very robust study, like it's got a very small sample size, or the findings that they got from it came from a flawed idea, or they're applying anecdotal things to it, which means that people not reading the study would maybe get a bad headline from it. I see. Emma, you're in the academic research world. What do you reckon about this? I think it's an interesting point because I think a lot of the times in academia, you actually don't really know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and it definitely is like a huge challenge when like you first get into trying to find trustworthy papers and how like what is a trustworthy paper? Because you obviously have like really high impact journals like nature or science but you know there's really good science and really good research in other journals as well um especially stuff that is probably more relevant to your field so how do you know if you're just reading in these journals that they're actually kind of trustworthy because i personally definitely always google like you know almost the answer i'm looking for um and then like a paper comes up and it's got some experimental results that back it and i'm like this is great but i think it really like took me a while to learn I actually need to maybe think a bit more critically and actually think of maybe things that might not be so good about what they're doing and I think a really good thing to tell in academia actually is especially if you're looking at experiments like how much do they go into the methods because I think some people are quite secretive about it but I think that's not really in like I don't know like the little like friendship of science that we have like no one can steal it because you published it mm. but like let's just you know make it easier for people to do it because that's also supporting your work. So I think I think I actually have got a bit better just from reading like the style of the, the writer to see like, is this actually something that is critical of its own work, then that's good because you can kind of like see that they're being a bit more honest. Um but I do think it's a really yeah, absolutely yeah. interesting point actually about how you know what to trust and what not to trust. Yeah, it's really interesting. How did we end up here? then in this place with things that like need to be debunked how did we get to a world where we're not sure what we can and can't trust one of the things mooncat found about papers yeah was about methodology and some of the evolutionary psychology studies were from say the 80s and they weren't repeatable so there was a big push for repeating old studies to see did it confirm and find the same results and actually sometimes they didn't and it was partly because of the analysis that they did so they could get some data and almost because they were looking for a certain result they found it in the in the data and sometimes it's not because malicious the thinking oh this must be the right answer but they're thinking oh maybe that data is a bit of an outlier that, you know, there's some underlying noise, so I need to correct for it. And then eventually you've kind of almost tidied it up in a nice, neat conclusion. Yeah, I think it's very easy to do that, that idea of like confirmation bias, of like expecting to find a result and then even subconsciously making it the result that you find is quite interesting. I think also another thing is that we learn more right as we evolve as society like mm. people believed the earth was flat because we didn't have planes and hot air balloons and satellites in the sky sending us pictures of a round earth and therefore you know we kept learning so it's easy to see why we would believe one thing and then learn more and change uh 
into thinking something else. Yeah, definitely. Like you have a theory and you test it with experiments and sometimes the experiment might have been flawed, like Emma said, the methodology or maybe the technology wasn't available to analyze that data in such detail that you could find what you were looking for. Sort of like the Large Hadron Collider needed to be that big to be able to get those results. It wasn't working on smaller scale, what are they called? Colliders? Particle accelerators. Yes. <laughs> I'm talking about a field I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in general, right? Yeah, you, you learn more as you as you go on, but you then have to kind of build on existing knowledge or revise it rather than saying, that's it, we found it. Yeah, it's important not to stop. Do you think there's a case for too much information, Emma? I really, I really, really do. I think, um, <laughs> especially when like you're looking into something niche uh, or even just like actually something like social, you might read a news article that's written by, you know, different people and you get different views on it. And you're like, this is actually like, there's so, I have so much information about an event that happened that I actually can't piece it together in my head. Um, and I find the same thing with like science, especially. And like, if you like find an experiment that proves one thing and you're like, okay, that makes sense. I've internalized that in my head. I understand that, understand that completely. And then you read something else and it's a different experiment, but it's basically disproved that. And you're like, well, you're not comparing the same thing but you've shown different things and I believe both things. So what's actually happening? Is there something that like else we need to do to find out or is one of them wrong or are both of them wrong because they don't agree with each other? Because I feel like what you always want is like someone to have the same thing as you, but I think that so rarely happens. Um, and there's so much information out there. I think like, um, I don't know. I think like there's like a stat somewhere. I don't know, but it's like the amount of like, Google results that have been like returned for each search it just like keeps on increasing um, with time because there's just oh, way more information <laughs> that keeps on and you're like I don't know and I guess there is also like the argument especially with things like Google is if like people pay to have their links earlier up then oh that's true you're gonna click on that and that's gonna have some form of bias as well but like of, of course you're gonna click on one of the first pages because I'm not scrolling to like page 160 just to find an answer um i can't remember the last time i went to the second page of google <laughs> so true <laughs> so how do we prioritize then if we've got all this information some of it agrees some of it doesn't some of it's solid research some of it might be a bit more sketchy how how do we know what to do next oh i think i think that's really difficult but if i take an example from from my field you kind of choose what matters to you most is it something happening quickly or is it happening at a low cost especially when there's something with no absolute right solution so climate change so many factors go into it this is why we can't just say we should absolutely just cover the whole entire planet with solar panels can't just do that because that takes up too much resource we or we don't have farmland you know, whatever. You have to kind of take different criteria into consideration, you know, multi-criteria decision analysis. Maybe that's the problem is when you have an abundance of information, you then have to apply some other level of thinking. Do you think that's very similar? I just, when you said a climate crisis and like something like kind of clicked, but like when you have loads of things to do and you're like, I just can't do a single thing. Oh yeah. And like, mm. are we having like a less efficient action to the climate crisis? Because I don't know, people in power, even just like smaller people just are like, I don't know what to do. Should I, I don't know, recycle everything into millions of different things? Or should I just, you know, walk to work or what else should I do that can help? So I feel like it's like a, maybe if there was, a study that was like the biggest difference that's going to be made is by this and then everyone will be like okay we're all going to make a plan to do that oh but the, everyone's the same <laughs> i think that's that's the biggest challenge is that if if you said here is your prescribed routine to <laughs> lower your impact it's not going to work for everyone you know there'll be limitations to the study and everyone has to kind of figure it out and i think that's maybe one of the challenges is yeah every study has a limitation but Sometimes maybe bad scientists don't recognize limitations 
Or they say, everything is for future study. <laughs> <laughs> the area of further research will be. The, uh, yeah, the climate change example is really interesting because it's like, it's like you said that people don't always agree necessarily, even if the research backs it up. So things like wind That's turbines... True are like generally agreed to be quite a good source of renewable energy but then people love to hate them right like they're noisy Mm. they're eyesores people love to bang on about the fact that they're bad for birds which might necessarily be true for some people but it's not necessarily true for every wind turbine in the you know entire country so like how do these ideas that are not necessarily wrong but also not necessarily right still like persist and are there more examples of stuff like that well literally one of the things i was thinking was we're not so worried about birds or bats with wind turbines anymore and that's because research has found that the amount of birds killed by wind turbines are multitudes less than household cats yeah so it's one of those where it's almost like a zero-sum game well, we can have wind turbines if we have no cats <laughs> or something, you know, but people aren't going to get rid Stop of having cats. Yeah. And there's already loads of cats. Yeah. I think um, another example of kind of not necessarily misinformation, but like just how some people are kind of reluctant to learn about new things and accept that into their kind of idea in their head is that dinosaurs literally have feathers <laughs> that's been a thing for like 10 years now when that first came out and there's still more stuff that keeps on coming out like recently like where there's like yeah again like some like feather like encased in amber resin and people are like i think still hearing about it for the first time but then you know if you ask like a kid or you even ask in the your average person to draw a dinosaur they won't draw feathers and even like the new jurassic world films that are coming out now the dinosaurs do not have feathers so i think i mean that's i guess hollywood but like i think people just like it doesn't really make a difference to them if the dinosaurs have feathers or not so they might as well just like have this own little idea and stick with what they kind of believe to in themselves so i think sometimes it's just a reluctance to change yeah I was just thinking that because I write about dinosaurs on a semi-regular basis and I like see recent research and then it's still, if you ask me to draw a dinosaur right now, I wouldn't draw a feathered dinosaur. (laughs) (laughs) I'm my own product of all these sort of theories. I think it gets, it takes like a long time. Like if you have a long standing idea to go from the research to public opinion to a generally held belief by the world is going to take a long time for like that shift to happen. Yeah, I think when I was looking at research for this, is like, how long does it take for an idea to get replaced by new research? And if we think about sort of the medical field where people want to get the best treatment, even when something is discovered and found to be a good or better way of treating someone, it might take eight years for that to actually start being delivered and Mm. that's in a in a very practical way and a very it's very urgent you know you want you want that to happen quickly i suppose people not drawing dinosaurs with feathers is not going to fundamentally harm us (laughs) on a very urgent level yeah i think that's true but it's also like it's the same things we were saying before isn't it it's like cost and priority like, yes, we want the best treatment for the best cures of different diseases, but that process takes a long time in the first place. Yeah. So then getting it into sort of general use is very, very difficult. What about things in a more modern world? How can we trust things online that we see nowadays? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really hard nowadays, honestly. I think especially, I feel like I sound like, I don't know, my parents in a way, even though <laughs> I know loads of people who work with AI, but I think it is actually a little bit scary, like, because there's loads of, I mean, even just on a recent US election, there was so much, like, genuinely fake videos of people saying support for Trump or support for whoever. Like, for example, Taylor Swift had to come out and then actually publicly say, this is fake. This isn't me. This isn't what I think. But, like, that video would have been shared to people and have power in itself. And so it's something that the more reliable they get and the more people just kind of see something, don't really check it and scroll past, but then take in from it 
the message is quite scary because it's getting really good. So I didn't see this. So was this a video generated using AI of Taylor Swift promoting or saying she supports Donald Trump for US president? election yeah i think it was even just a a voiceover of her voice oh wow but it was like because she's you know been on a million talk shows i mean i know they don't really need like an actual sample of the voice to do it but like there's just so much data on her that's around and especially like celebrities themselves there's so many pictures of them like at every single angle so if you just like train a data set just on taylor swift you will get a really good output if you're like I want to see Taylor Swift wearing like a red cowboy hat and, you know, and it starts to get pretty dangerous. Deep fake videos, so like completely like generated videos um, that like have people's faces like moving in them have actually gotten like really believable, which is pretty scary because there could be like a video of you saying something and doing something that you really just have never done ever. And then all of a sudden that's on the internet. And then it's, we still have the problem that it's on the internet now. It won't be taken off. Yeah, that's what my mum always used to say to me. Anything you put on the internet is going to live there forever. <laughs> uh-huh. I don't think anyone cares enough about my opinions to twist my words into a uh, political campaign. However, how do we know? Because you said that, you know, you heard Taylor Swift's voice on a video on the internet and then she came out and said that wasn't her, that's not what she thinks. But how do you know to then trust that that it is her saying, I don't support Donald Trump? I mean, we know it was Taylor Swift when she said it because... It was her social media account. I mean, actually, I say that. Someone could have hacked her account. But, yeah, we have to kind of use these things with passwords, verification to prove it was them who said it. But, you know, you can't scan or print money because there are little dots that... Oh, I know what you mean. Like, some inbuilt technology that means you can't just make your own money laundering scheme. Yeah, so you can't print your own money. I wonder if that's something that we could do with... AI generated content so people know it wasn't a real video yeah maybe that's a future application do you think there's like anything we can do at the moment like how do we how do we trust this stuff because a lot of Facebook is like an echo chamber or like verified accounts on social media what you follow if you're let's use the political example because that's easier if you're left-leaning Typically, you'll get left-leaning content, right? The algorithm feeds things to you that it knows you're going to like. So then it becomes its own echo chamber. I suppose online, Twitter has um, like a misinformation feature. But can we even trust that? Like who's making the decision to label content misinformation or, you know, not accurate? I don't know if that yeah requires oversight over a private company if they're making this information so available yeah if it can reach a if it can reach a lot of people do we have almost a social obligation for them to have good <laughs> good intentions do you think it pressures people to come out more to like say what they really think more have stronger opinions maybe but not in like a way that i think is necessarily productive because people feel like they have to say something <laughs> so that there isn't something that comes out that i don't know is, is claiming that they said something else so they have to kind of like put themselves out there where i think like is that really helping things a lot of the time i think sometimes there's always a bit too many opinions on the internet so i think maybe there needs to be less or if it's like a bit rushed yeah they didn't have all the information but they've just kind of gone with the headlines yeah this comes back to what we were saying before isn't it like things are missed in translation even between groups or you know if you're rushing to combat something that's been written about you Maybe you haven't taken the time to fully understand all the implications of what has been said or what you're going to say in response, which then I guess just feeds into the whole content machine that is social media. So there's this research centre called the Centre for an Informed Public. They find information that comes out and they frame it as rumours and they try and fact check those rumours and prepare sort of journalists or other research groups and this was in particular for the US presidential election. Okay, so their like mission is to combat misinformation then? Yeah, so when they find a new thing pop up, they will then try and get sort of where did this come from? How did it start? And where is the truth in it? 
or why people might have said it and what they might gain out of it. Yeah, that's the other thing as well. Emma, you probably see this a lot with like papers. Sometimes a paper saying the benefits of drinking red wine is sponsored by Australian red wine for everyone.com. <laughs> like stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Like the pinch of salt idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the example was obviously obvious, but I feel like sometimes people could be like, just care if it's just like a, a company that's like reputable as well and be like, oh, like this is a good company that's saying that. So that's nice, even if it probably does benefit the company as well. Yeah. But not to like uh, circle back to the Twitter like flag. There is, yeah, definitely the argument of who decides a flag. But I think like if you're scrolling and you see that there is a flag, you can still read the tweet, but I think mentally you just take a little note that's like, oh, maybe this isn't exact. Whereas I think on like Facebook, though, you don't even have anything that's an indicator. And so it's super easy to just believe everything you see. So I think even if like the indicator is not saying, you know, you can't really trust that, it just is a little bit of a mental check for you to go, oh, actually, this isn't, you know, perfect facts. Mm -hmm. So I think it's still a good idea, actually. And um, maybe, yeah, some like social media companies should take a little bit more responsibility. Because it affects them as it affects, like, loads of other people. Absolutely. And there's the, the thing that it could go, like, too far. Like, when does misinformation just become completely false? Or something like um, libel, where you can be sued over what you've said because it has actually no basis or you're, like, defaming someone's character. You know, those things... Anyone at the moment can write anything to a point. But if you're a journalist or you're publishing something that says one thing that's not true, then, you know, you do open yourself up to legal ramifications. From the K-pop world, <laughs> some entertainment companies have actually started suing people that spread rumours. I don't know if they're always necessarily fighting against false information or just fighting against information being spread about the people in their company that they don't want people to spread, such as if pictures of someone was smoking and that's a big taboo then they might have legal action against the people who posted the pictures and then spread them. Oh, that's interesting. Because presumably those pictures are real of that person smoking. Yes, it they might be real. They just don't want that image portrayed to their fans or whoever. Yeah. But then, yeah, it's like we are saying, weren't it? That it then leads to censorship and sort of, if you can't say this and you can't say that, then... I'll get that taken down. But then I guess that's a publicity thing from their end or the band's management or whoever. Yeah. Very interesting. I really like the Snopes fact check. They often come up with like quite wacky ones of like, oh, can a wombat run faster than Usain Bolt? Or like crazy things <laughs> that are like perpetuate on the internet, like silly things like that. But then they do, you know, do a deep dive and look at the research and speak to experts and find out if it's actually accurate. But then I guess it's like everything. You have to take it with a certain amount of cynicism, I suppose. Can we combat these things? Can we do anything to ourselves? Is there courses we could do? Or, you know, can we arm ourselves against all this misinformation that's out there in the world? I mean, we, especially having academic backgrounds, potentially have more of an idea than most about where research is coming from, perhaps. I think the main, like, I guess, thing to combat it is just to... Take your time when reading things because there's just so much like media out there. I think it's really easy to get lost in it. And I think I think you mentioned a course. I think that would be like even just like in a school, like just like how you can find a website that you can trust or um, anything like that would be really useful. Because I think I think I'm definitely maybe being ageist towards my mom here, but like I feel like she reads Facebook as like you know very very true and i don't think her facebook is plagued by a lot of misinformation but um you know i think like when we were first like getting to know the internet i think even our teachers would say a couple of things that was like you know just be careful what you read it's not always right anyone can write on it whereas i feel like my mom like she didn't really have that when she was growing up because there was no internet yeah so i think like with the growing times i think you know ai is a conversation probably you know probably definitely in schools right now in terms of like um not like cheating, but like help on things. And like, you know, um, so I think putting it into the curriculum naturally because people are going to be using it anyway is a really good way to get people to kind of educate themselves about it rather than just use and abuse it. I'd like a course, I think, on uh, debunking things. I think 
also there's there are websites that you can trust to a certain extent right like things like news articles from the guardian or the bbc yes they're not a hundred percent free of bias because nothing ever can be but in general they are held to a higher standard and are definitely at least trying quite hard to operate within the boundaries of the law and like journalistic rules so on the topic of is there a course well there are some uh, psychology papers not evolutionary psychology papers but psychology papers <laughs> we um, know those are all rubbish now did sort of look into some of the ideas so could we inoculate people that was the word that they used by giving them small doses of misinformation to learn from the process <laughs> i think they set up um, a game as well for that so this was a researcher called sander van der leiden linden who has done some work on inoculation the other paper that i was reading said okay it might be hard to inoculate people so we just kind of have to give them maybe a warning that you might be being misled yeah i suppose that's what emma was saying wasn't it about like, having something on social media that just says this might not be true yeah at least triggers you a little bit to be a bit more skeptical about even things that don't necessarily have that warning on. Mm. And then, yeah, I guess going to the original source maybe is the best idea. If you can find it. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the um, that's the other challenge, isn't it? If it's not behind a paywall. Mm, so true. But that inoculation uh, was reminding me of a, like a misinformation vaccine. <laughs> Small dose and you have to try and think of a way to not learn it. <laughs> I mean... Has anything got more inform- misinformation surrounding it than vaccines and that whole kettle of fish? Oh, I wonder. I wonder if someone's done the statistics about what's the most um, misinformed topic. Yeah, what do people have the most, I guess, wrong or like slightly off opinions about? Something to speculate on. Something else that kind of leads people down the wrong path, such as conspiracy theories, is that kind of gap of knowledge but also they're trying to fill that gap so much that they almost close themselves off from any new information that contradicts it so almost having to keep an open mind about new information and actually process it not just writing it off just because it disagrees with what you already know some people can get defensive right if you've always believed one thing and then suddenly new information comes to light that says maybe that wasn't quite right Instead of thinking, oh, that's interesting, people think you're attacking my belief system, you're attacking something that I've known to be true for a long time. And then that can lead to a lot of fear sometimes or worry about what's being, you know, shared. Classic example is, was it Copernicus who first came up with the model of the sun doesn't rotate around the earth, but the earth rotates around the sun. And he faced religious persecution for such an idea. We are not the centre of the universe after all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Heliocentric theory. Well, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It could just be one person that comes up with a, a new idea that happens to be right. We see that all the time in science, that what we thought was true isn't necessarily the whole picture. And then we learn more and, you know, grow and build on that knowledge and keep learning, I think is the important thing. Well, that feels like a good place to leave it i think we've covered just about everything that i could think of in regards to this there's conspiracy series there's taylor swift (laughs) there's how do we spot bad headlines modern examples examples from academia and even examples from the here and now if you're interested in any of these things links will be in the show notes as always and in the episode description and we'll see you next time for another episode Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.